thank you. Thank you again for coming. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce a couple guests with us. We, we have Paul Donnelly uh, from the Poughkeepsie High School. And I'm going to read because my memory doesn't work anymore, Paul. Uh, Paul's a teacher in the Poughkeepsie City High School District for 12 years. He teaches US history and government, participation in government. He's also an instructor at Vassar College's Urban Education Initiative. During the last two years, Paul has gotten involved with local and state politics due to the threat of school closures and the jail expansion in Dutchess County. He has been to Albany to lobby state legislators to fully fund and support public education. He's also written several art articles that have appeared in local and national publications. Paul will be running for office next year for Dutchess County Legislator. Um, he also left that to me whether I wanted to say that. Uh, Paul was introduced to me by Callie J. McKenzie, and I'm going to let Callie. Yeah. Hi, I am Callie Jane. I am a organizer of Citizen Action of New York, uh, the Hudson Valley chapter, um, which is in Kingston. Um, gosh, uh, what do I say? I, you know, have recently moved to the area um, specifically for organizing around some of the issues that I myself have been faced with. Um, I went and got my master's in human services to try and you know, help change the world and realized I didn't want to teach people to live within, within the system anymore. I wanted to teach people how to change the system. All right. So um, that is why I'm here. And yeah. Um, I suppose <coughs> um, th this is, I'm going to turn the light back here. So right. But uh, so <coughs> Mary Stewart and I started Story Horse when we moved up here. Uh, and the, the hope was to understand the place where we're living and where we're raising our kids. Um, we came here four years ago because we suddenly found out we were pregnant with our fourth child and fled the city in a panic. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it was just luck that we arrived here. But the thing about where we live, uh, it, there are so many inspiring people here. and it's immediately uh, apparent. The other thing about this place is that the land holds these stories and holds this history that is very tangible. Uh, we've lived our lives as gypsies for a long time. Most of our work is elsewhere from where we live or it's in New York City where you're entertaining a lot of uh, wealthy people. Um, and so the stories that we've been able to be a part of sometimes feel disconnected, have, to me, felt disconnected from home. And I think uh, there is a poet that was introduced to us by a farmer that we interviewed a, a few years ago. Uh, uh, and the poet's name is Wendell Berry, and he talks about the, the dangers when we start looking for stories elsewhere, uh, instead of our neighbors, instead of the people in our town, and what that used to be for people. Uh, and that there's a spiritual disconnect that can happen in communities. And when I read that, I thought, that has happened to me. And I, and I speak for myself, but that I felt very deeply. And so that's been the purpose of Story Horse, to try to learn about place from the people who are experiencing the issues most directly. Um, now there are, anyway, I, I, uh, I think there are a lot of questions we had when we start out, do we have a right to try to tell these stories as a very privileged white guy, uh, is it okay to try to work on this kind of story? But uh, this is our collective past, and I think uh, one of the things that uh, Russell Jones, who had to go catch a, had to head back to the city, he's in our cast, he's an amazing actor, and he started uh, they call blind spot, which gives a safe space for people to get things wrong and talk about these issues collectively. And I think it's important to try to step out and realize that we have to do this together because our country is in a place uh, that is not so different. It's not so different now from where this story took place. And so. Um, I'm happy to try to get things wrong, and 
and, uh, and then we can talk about it at least. So uh, if you have questions, Callie and Paul will certainly uh, help us all try to uh, get things wrong and right a little bit. Well, if you have Lorraine Roberts information, which you did, you're, you're going to probably be pretty right. <laughs> Lorraine pretty much got things right, and obviously Professor Matthew as well. So it's very well researched. I think the, uh, the, Could you speak a little louder, please? Sure. The displays in the background were wonderful. You know, to see the old handwriting and to hear and see the old phrasing of the way that people spoke. Um, I really liked uh, having those visuals as well as the actors. Thank you. And, I, and you know, I, I would say uh, this is the first time Mary Stewart and I have hired an artistic team, uh, aside from Mary Stewart directing it. We, Carl Cofield uh, brought on his design team. Uh, Devante Johnson was our projection designer, and uh, he's right back there. In his <laughs> Toop was our sound designer and Alan Edwards, the lighting designer, and they just did an amazing job they, on a very short amount of time to work on. And so I think their work and the cast that uh, basically spent this whole weekend basically volunteering their time to come share these local stories with us. You can't do a reading, you can't get the life out of a reading unless you have this kind of cast, and we're yeah. just so grateful. It's also true that uh, what, what you say about seeing the actual penmanship is like touching a person. You know, it's like it's like touching into history in a more visceral way, which you can see what it looks like, the piece of paper that is in front of the person who's reading it and was touched by the person who wrote it. There's something that we lose in our digital a digital uh, passing on of history, you know, and the other piece is the oral part of history is so critical, especially uh, these histories that maybe it doesn't seem, it, it, George Washington is a star a character in this show, but everyone else is somebody you might not have heard of before. And, but to hear those histories passed along uh, through a community and through through um, the oral history is where real history is, lives. And so um, historical societies are important, families are important, letters are important. You know, hanging on to those archives really, really helps us have a real sense of real history and the context in which things happened, um, as opposed to just from a textbook written by a corporation <laughs> taught at a, you know what I mean? It's, it's a different way of experiencing um, history and also if we want you know younger people to to uh, know this history we have to um, make it present day and have a kind of energy to it um, rather than blow the dust oh, the book and you know you, you want to feel like it's um, it, it's living right now in the present um, and I think Jeremy I haven't had a chance to say this I think he did a brilliant brilliant job with this uh, material Note that in my experience, this is as gripping and moving a piece as, as the American icon, Our Town. But this is Our Town. It is oh. my town. And Jeremy Davidson, you have written an extraordinary work. And the actors here gathered in the direction of everybody who put it together have moved me profoundly. And this needs to be in the icon of every. What's important if in small towns, at least my experience, we can. It's much easier for me to feel how we affect each other's lives, mm -hmm. and I, I'm, it's very kind of you, Chris, to, to say that. But like, these are a lot of voices that are not heard. Yes. And I, I'm not saying this in a, I'm not like beating my chest. It's real simple to listen to each other, and these stories exist. 
But when you have uh, school systems uh, where the majority of students are taught by white teachers, or administrations in places of power where you have just white people, most students won't hear these voices. That's right. And that's all of our responsibility. Now, I, th I do believe that theater can reach students and reach all of us in a way that reading doesn't always uh, uh, work. But it is our responsibility to say, like, well, wait, wait, wait. Why am I getting history from that <coughs> angle and not that angle? Because the truth is we only learn, I only learn, <laughs> from people who are real different than me. I've been surrounded by artists and actors and writers and filmmakers most of my adult life, and it gets to be an echo chamber. And they all sound lovely, and everybody has great intentions and some of the most amazing activists and all that. It's an echo chamber, though. Mm -hmm. And the divide in our country happens because we don't listen mm -hmm. all the time, and we don't get leaders who are different than us. And don't, we don't take risks and say, I'm gonna listen to that person because they really are a leader. It doesn't matter how different they are. We need leaders, we need leadership. And I, I'm, and you guys can, can speak to that. Callie, Paul, if you wanna address it. There's a hand over here. Oh, I just wanna know how long it took you to gather. <coughs> uh, so we, we, I wrote, I read an article in the Chronogram, I guess, uh, it was like an archive, archival um, article about a man in Kingston who had an uh, issue with a pipe in his basement and went down to look at the pipe and dug in the ground and found bones and realized that his house had been built on top of uh, an African American burial ground there. And the article was really interesting. I was like, wow, that, it's an amazing story, and Brian McAdoo was quoted in that story. And um, I'm going to get the name. I'm not sure the name of the organization in Kingston that has uh, worked very diligently to hold on to that history. But they called Brian to see if he would do a survey of it. And I, he ended up not doing that one, but I. But he had done. He com commented in the article about the Rhinebeck Cemetery and the survey. And the, the article was from 2010. And so I wrote him an email, and that was two years ago. Um, Brian lives in Indonesia now. And he studies tsunamis. Um, and uh, he's remarkable. And he, uh, he came and saw a workshop of this uh, about a year and a half ago in this barn. Uh, the draft was a bit different, but he told me he was going to be in the Hudson Valley and for three days. And we said, oh, you can at least hear where we're at. And, uh, and he said to me immediately, well, you need to contact Lorraine. She's the one who's driving all this. <laughs> and so Lorraine, uh, I went back and forth with Lorraine, and she and Brian were coming to, uh, we were gonna get coffee with them at Bread Alone and record the, the conversation as we, just a casual conversation that we have with people. And Lorraine uh, called that morning and just was uh, too sick to join us that day. And so we met with Brian and Lorraine was very ill, and she passed. Uh, I never met Lorraine. Um, and that's part of this. That's part of it. And it's that these voices go away. People, we all die. And there are people, there are leaders, who are working to make sure that we understand that we're a healthier society. And uh, you can find her her talks online on YouTube, you can listen to her there. Um, and very, uh, just an amazing spirit, clearly, an amazing woman, and her work, what her work was. Okay. Yep, please. I just want to just uh, touch upon what you said. Um, you said that we have, we're not really far removed from the history that this story takes place. And um, I've been teaching in Poughkeepsie City School District for, uh, for 12 years, and uh, I, you know, I, I understand you know, the issue that, that race plays in, in, in the educational system with, with my work. Uh, I work in the, the poorest uh, city in the, in the county. Um, the schools, several schools may be closed uh, this year. Um, there is a quarter of a billion dollar expansion that's uh, it's going in right down the road from one of the schools that may close. And uh, you know, when you, when you think of like segregation, you think of like Jim Crow era, uh, it's easy to, to look to the south, you know, to look at 
look in the, in the past and in the 60s, but uh, there was a study done just a couple years ago, and the results were that New York State is the most economically and racially segregated state in the whole country. Yeah. 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 And that's, this is all happening at a time when we're living under this regime of a mass incarceration. And it's, this is happening right here in Dutchess County. And, uh, you know, um, part of what I do as a, as a teacher, I guess, is, is tell stories. And uh, I just want to share a story with you. It's, uh, I'm getting emotional because it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking. So, so I had a debate in my class. I teach U.S. history, and uh, each, each of the students, I had them, they get to pick, you know, what issue they wanted to debate. And uh, a lot of students pick public education because uh, they, they see the work that I do, and you know, I tell them when I go to Albany, I tell them I'm fighting for them. So uh, this one little girl, you know, Dijanae, uh, she comes up to me after class. This is all Thursday before I Friday off. We didn't quite get through the whole debate, and she says, uh, "You know, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't get up in front of class. I just can't do it." But I wrote, I wrote a letter about about what I want to say to the class. It was maybe, maybe you could read it for me. And uh, she said, uh, "You know, I want to talk about education because I know that's that's what you're talking about a lot." She goes, "I don't understand why um, they're going to close our school down, and we don't have books. We don't have money for books." But we have money just to just keep putting people in jail. And she was like, that, that makes me angry. So, you know, that, that's her fight is my fight. And that's why, you know, I, I get involved. And, you know, I don't know if it's leadership or what, but, you know, I, I grew up uh, upstate New York. Most of my parents were farmers. And uh, I lived, I had a, a pretty comfortable life for the most part. But I see that my students, they don't have what, what I had. And for my ninth graders, they have four years. And after four years, you know, they're out, and it's 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 just not good. It's, just, it's not good for the legacy that we're we're creating for our students. What what they're going to inherit? Um, you know, this is we have to have these conversations. And we really, it's now it's, it's more important now than ever to, to really get involved in the fight for social justice and educational justice. And I just thank Jeremy and his wife for letting me be a part of this. I really appreciate it. Can you can you talk specifically about the the funding of education in New York State and, and what's going on with that right now? Could you speak a little more? We're asking, okay, talk sorry. about funding of education in, in New York State for. Uh, go ahead, Kelly. You know, I, I actually, so Paul has been a citizen action member for a really really long time. Um, he's actually been here longer than I have, and as a teacher, I mean, he's really led the charge. Um, in, in trying to get a lot of the funding that is owed to New York City schools. Um, some of you may or may not have heard, there was a 150-mile walk from New York City to Albany recently, which was commemorating a 10-year anniversary of when uh, the judges said that in order to have a equitable education experience, there are schools around here that are owed you know, billions of dollars. Um, Poughkeepsie City Schools are owed so almost nine. nine. I'm almost nine. Like eight point nine million dollars. Yeah, eight point nine million dollars. City of Poughkeepsie Schools. Yet the budget for education has actually gone down. You know, they said we're closing schools while expanding prisons, um, and so we have been trying to get this funding, but there are all these different issues that are stopping it. Why we don't have the money? Why we? Don't have the money. <coughs> options, the access. Um, and we think about education and it's supposed to be the great equalizer. And there are cities and towns where people are not getting, children are not getting the experiences that they're supposed to get. They're not given the opportunities they're supposed to get. And I mean, I think about, you know, what you said about not having enough teachers um, who are, you know, teachers of, of color that can communicate and relate you know, that really shows the, the racism that's within the institutions. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's so many different levels of racism. And, you know, an individual has an opinion. You know, maybe you look at me and you're going to clutch your purse a little bit tighter. And, you know, if you name call, that's interpersonal. But when you take on the power of the institution that you're a part of, 
whether that's education or you know police or government, whatever it may be. Banks. If banks, when you use your racism or your your perceptions of people and you put it into the power structure that you're in, that's when it really, really affects people. I mean, banks, that's a you know really great point. We think about wealth of you know people of color and why it seems that people of color are always going to be a little bit lower. Well, you know, there was slavery and then there were Jim Crow laws and then there was redlining where black neighborhoods were not given mortgages until 1968, the FHA could deny a black person a mortgage based on them wanting to live in the suburbs. You know, so when you use that power that you have to do bad, and, and that can include kicking a student out of the classroom because you don't understand what they're going through. You know, we talk about you know, codes of conduct in schools where here in the Hudson Valley, I mean, Kingston and Poughkeepsie City, you know, city schools, black children are being expelled at rates, you know, astronomically compared to their, their white peers. Um, and so the reason why I'm really glad to be sitting here today is that it's, this is a piece about history which is comfortable. It is comfortable to talk about history. These things happened, it was terrible, but now we're great. No. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know if everyone got to look at, you know, the dates as they appeared up here, but, you know, trying to put a story in a paper in 2015 about racism and how it's still alive and well, right. and it can't get published. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's why I'm glad that we can have these conversations and get uncomfortable, you know, call people in instead of calling people out and, and be a part of these conversations. Be willing to say the wrong thing so that you can do the right thing. So I don't know if that was a bit of a tangent, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Last night uh, we uh, had um, a discussion with some different people and one was, um, what's Jordan's last name? Jordan Taylor. Sorry. Yeah. Um, who is um, one of the founders of the Hudson Valley Black Lives Matter uh, chapter. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and he was saying that there, the platform for um, Black Lives is Vision for Black Lives. Mm -hmm. You can Google yeah. it. And you can read every point in this um, platform. And I was like, gosh, I didn't even know about that. And it, it made me feel so good that um, you know that we can keep having these conversations that we can make we can we can venture into the conversation and uh, and however much we make mistakes risk being wrong uh, well-intentioned white folks need to risk being wrong and because I think we're afraid of being impolite we're afraid of saying the wrong thing we're, we feel we've done enough wrong and, but we haven't done enough right, right? So, so um, we need to get into the conversation and we need to um, find, out, um, find out what's going on, all the good that is going on, but all the help that is needed. And one thing Jordan said was, um, you know, when somebody asked actually, <laughs> it was Michael's wife who said, well, okay, so what can we do? And he said, we need bodies to show up at these events and we need we need money, and we need yeah. your arts and crafts, and we need somebody to make a covered dish. We need actual involvement in the movement yeah. by white people, yeah. not just black lives yeah. saying black lives matter, right? It's obvious, but it's important. And it was, I just wanted to represent what he said, too, because yeah. it was a, those were good points that were made. And the other good point that was made that someone else who was not here said um, uh, was that um, don't unfriend those friends that you don't agree with, because mm -hmm. then you're talking to an echo chamber. You're just speaking inside your own circle. You might as well be looking in the mirror. Don't unfriend, right? Mm -hmm. Think, oh, this is an opportunity to talk, right? This is an opportunity to get this going and out of the point of talk to action. So I just wanted to share that from the last two days that these discussions have been really mm -hmm. great from my perspective and also spending the time with these incredible people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to respond.
on to about the Black Lives Matter then we'll platform. Ask the questions. Yeah, sorry. Um, just quickly, if you haven't read the, the vision for Black Lives and the, the policy platform, you should definitely take a look at it because a lot of the time people think Black Lives Matter is all about police reform. No. But it's not. It's about voting rights, it's about getting money out of politics, it's about education, it's about, you know, how do we hold people accountable because it's not just you know, police reform that's affecting black lives. It's education, it's it's the inability to run for office and be able to represent your community because you don't have a super PAC in your back pocket. You know, so there are a lot of different things that you need to think about within that movement for black lives. And it, it can be the environment, you know, a lot. We look at the environment, we talk about the polar bears and the degrees Celsius that things are rising and melting. But let's talk about the fact that it's the black communities that have bad water, mm -hmm. that it's the, the low income and black communities that have what we call the bomb trains running through them of crude oil, crude back in oil, but right through Kingston. So no matter what we look at, it's environmental justice, exactly. We need to understand that every issue is happening, but there are communities that are being affected specifically and more. Yeah. I, I, I have to say this carefully. Uh, I'm Irish, and I like depression. <laughs> I like rain, I'm happy with it. I am sometimes fearful of solution. I, I think one thing solution lets us do, talking about white guy here, is leap to the abdication of the reality. And what I love about this piece is, uh, is the ground is howling uh, the pain that we live in as. And I think it's as important to move into solution, it's important to remain grounded mm. in the fucking god-awful reality. Um, because my guess is it's beyond our imagination what we need to do about this. My guess is that there are going to be things we can step to, but there are going to be things we need to imagine, and we need to get bigger, you know. Um, and it's pretty dangerous when we think we have solutions. It's, it's pretty dangerous when, and I know a lot of voices that said Barack Obama is the president, so that's, we're now post-racial, right? Um, so I worry a little, I just want to throw out that I worry a little about solution, and then I'm joyous in the, in the questions. That, that came up. Mm -hmm. I, one question. John. Um, I, oh, God, so many. We were talking last night. We all went out to dinner to uh, Panzuri. Am I correct? Panzuri. It was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't been, go. No, it's very, very good. Um, and we were. We were talking, and I, and, and something that certainly came up for me that I'm certainly very sensitive about, as an African American man, is how race, how racism has played such a central and defining role in my life, even though I didn't want it to. Uh, I'm up against forces that are more powerful than me, and I was equating the power of racism to the power of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Is that strong? Yep. And so if we, if we, for me as an African-American African man, what I seek is, is equity, uh, agency, and resources. And so if I come to a community like this, I don't see too many of people who look like me, so I automatically can say, well, there's no equity here for me. And then I have to go further and say, well, why is that? What, why can't I see myself reflected in places that I go to? This is a big problem. So the answer, I'm not saying there's an answer, but then you have to kind of use that as the question and say, okay, why isn't the neighborhood equitable? Why aren't there many black people here? What has prevented them? I'm sure people, black people who look like me want to move here. I know they do, but they don't seem to be here. So then that's just the question that you have to ask yourself. Well, why in this community do we not have a stronger representation of African Americans? I work as an actor, and so when I do theater gigs, I often want that same level of diversity. I want to perform with a company, with a group that looks at the world that I, the same way that I do. So I'm represented 
there are other diverse races that are also represented on that stage. So I seek to bring that because that's my way of, you know, leveling the playing field, allowing racism not to affect me as, it, as much as it does. But I went even further. I was in England doing a show and my father came over and we talked, because I'm from England, I was born in England, but we talked about England and why my father left England. And the reason why he came to England was to help rebuild it after World War II, as so many people from the West Indian Islands did. And when he got here, he couldn't, when he got to England, he couldn't find a place to live. The people in England would refuse to provide homes or rent homes or rooms to anybody that was black. So it was just horrible until Winston Churchill had to get on the radio and make an announcement to the country to say, listen, these are good people. Let them rent, sell them homes. They deserve to be here just as much as any, any of the rest of us. So that's how my father got his first apartment and then a house. But then he eventually moved from England because it became very racist and he didn't want to raise his kids in that environment. So it was like we jumped out of, hmm, out of England and came to North America. We came to Canada. Canada was fine. The first time I heard the word nigger was when I set foot in the United States. I didn't even know that word existed as a young, well, I'm saying like 10, 11 years old. I just not heard the word in Canada. So I guess the point of what I'm saying is back to that original statement of how powerful racism is. And the only way that I could address it with people is to say, well, let me talk to you about it so that you can kind of understand the ground on which it is that I stand and how powerful racism is to then question yourself and say, not to say like, well, what can I do about it? But just to start to think about it. Like if I was in that young man's shoes and everything that is defining his life is based upon racism, how would I feel? I mean, there are structures and systems that are so much more powerful than me that I come up against the other day. When I walk down the street, even in New York, but certainly here, and I see a cop car, I'm concerned because although I shouldn't be, that could be the moment that my life ends. Now that's a certain level of stress that I have to carry around because that's my reality. But I gotta tell you, it sucks. It sucks. And I know my white counterparts never have to deal with that because when they see the cops, it's like, oh, they're here to protect me and serve me. But when I see the cops, even though I know I've done nothing wrong, I have to think about the fact that my life could end in any number of ways through this policeman. So I'm not saying to you, hey, you guys, you're white, do something about it. I'm just saying meditate on that. And is that the way you would want to be treated or you would want your life to be directed or guided because these forces are much more powerful than anything I can throw at them. And then also, I looked at this whole thing with Obama, his presidency, and I can speak for myself and I would say all the other black people in this room, how powerful that moment was. Because as God is my witness, it was never something that as a black person you thought that there would be a black president of the United States in my lifetime. And it happened. So for me, that was this watershed moment where perhaps we can begin to turn our back on racism. But then what just happened Tuesday means, and certainly from, I think, from Donald Trump's perspective and the Republicans that supported him, they're looking to dismantle Obama's legacy. And when they do that, they dismantle me, I mean, personally on some level, and they dismantle us, let's put it that way. They dismantle all those people that are socially progressive. I'm not even gonna call you Democrats, I'm just gonna say socially progressive, <laughs> liberal folk, right? But that's what they're looking to do, so then I say, well, what is that? That's racism rearing its ugly head again in, a, in, a, in probably even maybe a more powerful form than it, what, it, what it was in the past. So I don't have solutions, and I think that's great because solutions are scary to me, but I do have experience in saying this is what my life is and this is why it makes it so stressful sometimes to be an African-American male because when you look up, you're dealing with forces that are obviously against you and they're insidious. And sometimes you can't, you can't even see them, but they appear out of the shadows. And I'm not just talking about it as a black male, but I would say black people everywhere. And I, I'm kind of frustrated at this moment because 
as I said earlier, Obama's presidency to me was a way to turn my back on the racism. But now this thing has happened Tuesday, and so something else is, is present now. And so the fight that we have going forward is even harder than the fight that we just got out of. And that's what makes it frustrating. Hi there. I just want to say that um, I'm a member of a group called Kenjin, which is and the new Jim Crow Action Network, and we are in Kitsi and Kingston, New York. And every three to four months, we're having what we're calling white privilege workshops in Kingston. So if anybody would like to come, please do E-N-J-A-N, is it an acronym? And um, look us up and come, because it's good work for you know people of color and white people to come together and look at white privilege and what does it mean and this is and thank you. You were all brilliant and amazing. That's a great thing you said because that allows blacks and whites to get together and continue this discussion because I feel the only way out of this vice grip, which I will call racism, is to just start talking about it, all of us in whatever way. And it, you, you think of something like, oh, a white privilege workshop, or, or you say people might feel like, wow, white privilege. But yeah, that exists. And it's good to kind of like own that and say that that exists. And that helps me in the course of my life, because it does. And how do we kind of look at that and see the impact that it has on others? You know, I do wish and hope for a world where there's generosity and kindness and love and giving. I really believe in that, and I believe that people are innately good before they're anything else. I innately believe that democracy is something that's in our DNA. It's a system that we all seek and want for. But we've got to find ways to begin to just discuss and break down some of the barriers because I can just say to you that I really mean it when I say racism is as powerful as capitalism, and you don't see anybody trying to get rid of capitalism. It's just a system of the world that allows the world to function. And if we're going to say that racism is another system of the world that allows it to function, then it's certainly not a world that I want to be a part of. Um, uh, so many powerful things have been said. And I don't know that I can remember all the responses that I have. I just want to say that um, uh, my wife, Vivian, and I are here from Clinton County. Uh, we're founders of the North Star Underground Railroad Museum at Osable Chasm. There are now two Underground Railroad Museums in the Champlain Valley. And stories are told in both of those museums about Quakers who came from Dutchess County. Ronald T. Robinson moved to Vermont, and it's his home that is now underground. Well, there's an underground railroad museum at his home at Ferrisburg, Vermont. And the principal people who were the abolitionists in Peru, New York, were from Dutchess County. At the same time, slavery came to Plattsburgh from Dutchess County because the founder of Plattsburgh was a slave owner. His name was Zephaniah Platt. His brother was a slave owner and so on. So anyway, um, don't apologize for, for being Irish. The Irish. I don't. I'm just. No. I don't want to revel in it too much. I'll drown. <laughs> the Irish have not and there's a lot of terrible history about Irish and, and, and black relationships in the United States. But in Europe, the Irish have the soul. So Irish. To connect the experience of African Americans very, very much. Um, when we moved, we moved from Chicago to Clinton uh, County, and for a very long time, people would uh, look at Vivian and say, Well, how did you get here? You know, like, what is this black person doing here? And then I discovered that my great grandfather was born in Columbia County. So I started dropping that on people. Because no matter how long, if you come from somewhere else, if you're in upstate New York or in Vermont, you never really belong. Okay. So when I I dropped that on people, oh my great grandfather was born in Hillsdale. Oh, that shuts them up. But um I've 
we've been processing the results of the election too. And I didn't want to admit it, but I was doing some research. I'm researching the story of a veteran of the uh, War of 1812, because we have a commemoration on Plattsburgh <coughs> Reserve for the Battle of Plattsburgh. This was a mixed race man, and um, um, I'm doing this research for who do you think you are? They're going to be doing a feature on a descendant of this man. I don't know who it is. They won't tell me, so I can't give you any details about the research, except that I have, I'm in touch with the descendants, and one is fine with this African ancestry, and the other doesn't want it to be known publicly, but he's getting his DNA. <coughs> Thank you. I, yeah. one, of the, one of the questions I have, and it's, it's a thing, this is, it's not a knock against this history. It's just that in this area often what we, when we talk, when I mention to someone that we're doing, that we're doing this story, what is immediately talked about, and, and this is really not a criticism of, of your work at all, it's that often in, up in this county, the conversation wants, people seem to want to talk about the Underground Railroad. And that is part of this, this structure that, my guess is that that is taught first here to children. And what the structures that came before that in this, in this state and still exist in different forms, but they exist and locked people into this uh, entrapment, for, it, the, the conversation steers away from it so we just can feel good about where we live in a certain way. And both conversations have to happen. And, uh, and, and I think uh, it's more difficult to, to have the conversation, but it isn't, it's not just in the past, and that's what is... Uh, well, I really wasn't finished, you know. No, no, I know, but we, we do have to get, unfortunately, we have to get the actors to the train. I want, I want to say something about the election results. Okay, very quickly, if you don't yeah. mind. Okay, I think that the only way for us to move forward is I did not vote for him. I would never vote for him. But if Hillary had won, we wouldn't be forced to make the changes that we need to make. And we wouldn't be forced to take personal responsibility for our history, our, our, our future. I agree. I agree. And, and that's what all of us are now being called to do. There's a girl over there. Yes, yes, yeah, please. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Angelica. I'm from Mexico. And I moved here around uh, a few months ago. And what I have realized that in my community in Mexico and also here it happens is that uh, youth are very disconnected to their reality and just to the other. Um, I made a research about youth in Mexico, and the second problematic that we have is that we are very antipathetic to the environment. And coming here, I have realized that also in my high school, uh, no, thank you. In Halloween, I decided to dress and to express part of the reality that women happen in Mexico because I feel that all the youth are very alien. So I dress, I put a Mexican blouse, and I put, I, I, and I put like, if I was hidden in the half of my face and in the other part, if I was like a skeleton. And I wrote no more violence and a symbol of PFP women. Because in Mexico, every woman, uh, if you're a woman in Mexico and you walk in the streets, you feel afraid of being murdered or being um, received, uh, being raped, sorry, or receive a, a horrible uh, insult. And when I was walking in the, in the, in the hallways, people told me like, oh, domestic violence, that is true. But they, they saw me as uh, like in their own reality. And I, I think that all these events where you can express or in dialogues or in debates, you can manifest it or you can express part of the reality and you can change this taboo of, uh, of feeling alien or feeling Antipathetic. So I think that this type of theater or um, this type of different things should brought in, should should be bring into 
high schools or should be bring into youth people because we are going to be in 20 years the major labor force and we are being a leader. And I'm very concerned that this is happening in all parts of the world. So I don't know, like, uh, I, I just want to express like we shouldn't just use like these type of events where a few people come to express themselves and to express their reality in order well, I have realized that when you express um, your reality or you express um, something different, um, there is this connection with the other person. And when there is this connection, you start taking care about the other, and you start being an active citizen, and you start doing something for the other. So I think that these type of events uh, should be in all the high schools, instead of having just superficial things, because uh, and, and not just this type of event, but also in our day life, we should express and we should communicate what we think and oh, have this debate with others. Although you don't agree, so uh, you think, oh, you will expand your mind and you will expand your perception about reality. And I, I really say thank you to you to try to do this here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for having um, uh, performance for the community. Um, not everybody can go to the theater these days since it's so expensive. And to be able to see something like this and be here and be part of it, um, when the issues are so much a part of what we want to be thinking about, um, I just really want to thank you for that. There is an organization called Transition USA, and it's based on a, a transition that was taking place in Britain. And the idea is to give communities a way of establishing community. It's like a broad, we've done it in Marbletown, it's being done in Woodstock. And in Woodstock, they've gone very far. They've gone uh, community meetings about their garbage, about fires, about the policemen, about how they treat the, the homeless. Um, it's called Transition USA. You can look it up on, the, tele, on uh, the internet and it will tell you how to start meetings because it's about community and we're all that. Thank you. I, I, um, we should wrap up, but uh, I also just... Um, I thought this last night, Callie, because uh, Jordan, I, I don't know how, how old Jordan is, 20, 23? 23. 23. Jordan's 23. And uh, clearly, uh, this young, young lady here, uh, it is so inspiring, because I was not this way, and I still have difficulty, but uh, when I was that age, when I, there was no way I would embrace my voice and being a part of something uh, greater than myself. No way. And to see Jordan last night, see you, uh, see you and, and Elena Mosley is here and what your work is in Hudson is extraordinary with, with the leaders that we have to look to because we haven't quite gotten it right, our generation. We haven't quite got it right, but there are people and uh, that we can look to who are starting uh, to share their voice, and we really need to tune in to uh, people such as yourself and can Citizen I, Action and Kings. I hope you can participate with them as well. Can I just say yeah, one Mike. Thing? And I'm so glad you're both here. And I think before we leave, I mean, I would love to ask the question of you. What are the actionable things that you would Thank like you. to see yeah. done? Thank you. Where can people go? Yeah. What groups can they connect with? How can they work with you? How can we work with each other? And some very, you know, real-time things that yeah. people might be interested in. I mean, honestly, so we talk a lot about community power and, you know, um, I don't know if anyone in this room has heard me say this before, but the <laughs> grassroots and the trees you probably have. Um, you know, my nine-year-old daughter asked me once, you know, what does grassroots mean? And I said, well, you see all those trees out there. We're actually on our way back from Bard, so we were like right here. And I said, you see all the trees 
out there. You know, they're really big and we notice them first and they're kind of overshadowing, but then you see all the grass and there's a lot more grass, but it's smaller. I said, that's a grassroots made. If we all come together, we can overpower the trees. And then I was like, well, come on, I'm gonna say that again. But it, it really comes down to, to building and working together both, it, we talk about inside strategy and outside strategy. A lot of the time my husband says to me, he goes, well, we can't work with that government. And I'm like, absolutely not, not that government. But that's why we need to build community power and get people into it and get people involved and get people to pay attention. You know, the people who vote, it, it, it's, I think it was 50% of the country, 49 point, not, you know, something didn't vote, of eligible voting age people. Um, so, but then there's also outside strategy. There's pushing, you know, the elected officials to do things. It's bringing people together so that we can, you know, rally and protest and strategize. And we have meetings weekly, pretty much, at Citizen Action. And we do lobby days. We go to Albany. We, you know, have big protests. We, you know, welcome, you know, elected officials into their offices in exciting ways when we don't want them there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but we're a community. You know, we're having a potluck on Tuesday in Kingston, 637 Grand Street, anyone wants to come, bring a dish. Um, but we're gonna talk, we're gonna strategize, we're gonna figure out what do we do, you know, both locally, you know, we've got people who don't know what a city, a city council person does, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe these people wanna run to be city council members, you know, we have county legislators, hopefully him in the future. Um, you know, we have to come together and we have to build, um, we need to work. Now, uh, and I'm going to finish up in two seconds, but I want to tell you the craziness of the past few weeks as we were running elections and we had people coming in. And, you know, there are folks who are like, oh, I can't knock on doors. I can't make phone calls. Why have people who showed up to take out our recycling? People who dropped off food. I had a volunteer who went every Friday night to Meredith Spread to pick up some donations to feed our volunteers. That's what a community is. That's what a movement is. That's coming together and doing the work that we need to do so that we are building our base and we are powerful and we are strong. It's about having the conversation, but also taking action. It's about not being in an echo chamber. It's about wanting to push things forward and challenge people and listen. Listen to people. Um, and be an ally, but not because you want to say you're an ally, but because you're really an ally. Um, so yeah, I, I really come out, be a part of things, figure out how you can fit in, whether it is knocking on doors or making phone calls or you know writing letters to the editor or you know dropping off a pie. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, and we're the grass. We're small, but there's a lot more of us. So we've got to push past all of these horrible things that are happening now. And we got to walk with vision. So. Probably one. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what to add to that, Kelly. You pretty much said it all. <laughs> but just, uh, just be involved. Uh, I mean, I'm still trying to gather my thoughts from what happened on Tuesday, and it's easy. I think, I think our biggest enemy in this country is hopelessness, and I see that because I see that in my class every day. It's hopelessness, but we cannot turn away. We have to keep fighting for it now more than ever. It's, it's, it's more important to keep fighting. And like Kelly said, just get involved, whether it's writing a letter to your editor, whether it's paying attention to local politics, because that's probably where, where it's where we're going to affect your life even more. Um, just finding a group, an advocacy group, like Citizens Action, or if you want the Working Families Party, um, just just be involved and be a voice. And if you all can do a little, little bit of that, I think we can start a movement. I really think that, um, that this country needs like a new economic or civil rights type movement in the 60s. And if we all can work together and build on that, I think we can reclaim our democracy. Because um, as Zephyr Teachow said, she's, our house is on fire. And we could either run away, or we could run straight into that fire with buckets in our hands, and we can rebuild something bigger and better. And that's what we have to do. 